hi everybody i'm just going to play a free improvisation to start as people gather and you can feel free to front load any questions you have as we go thanks for tuning in
Silk Road colleague of mine, uh, our, our Guruji at uh, Silk Road Global Musician Workshop for many years, Mr. Sandeep Das. Sandeep plays the tabla in the Silk Road Ensemble. And uh, we put that together, kind of mashing up a, an Indian spiritual song and an American gospel song. Um, and uh, so that I, I wanted to kind of improvise and set that up as a way to kind of uh, maybe set the tone for. Um, my general lack of focus um, stylistically uh, and um, my enjoyment uh, of, of really connecting with, with musicians from, from other cultures. It's really sort of my favorite thing to do professionally. Um, and uh, so that's sort of how, you know, I found myself over the years, you know, being able to, you know, be a long-term part of the Silk Road Ensemble and uh, then founding, directing this Global Musician Workshop. Um, and I say this because, you know, I'm actually just at home, uh, but this was supposed to be um, the time that the Global Musician Workshop would have been happening at the New England Conservatory this year. Uh, it's a week-long workshop where musicians of all backgrounds get together and collaborate with the faculty who also come from a variety of backgrounds. So um, this community meeting is, is one of our events that happens. Um, and it's really like the moments during the day where everybody's together, nobody's in rehearsal. And that's why we call it the community meeting. And it's really kind of a get to know you session for the faculty to talk and play and for the participants to ask questions. So in this equation, you, you are the participants. So uh, feel free to ask me anything you want. Um, I'm gonna speak a little bit more and play one more th thing uh, on these microphones because I've got um, should, I should have a hint of reverb going. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I can hear the reverb. Um, and then uh, as we kind of um, start talking more, I'll switch to a different mic and sit down. Um, but uh, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about my journey as a musician. I played cello, and that means that um, I grew up playing Western classical music. Um, and it started to dawn on me I guess kind of as early as high school, but for sure in college, that, you know, I grew up in Kansas. I grew up in, you know, the late 20th century. Um, playing cello, you know, which is largely, you know, European music, and it just occurred to me how arbitrary it was that I ended up playing this instrument and playing this kind of music. And when I finally embraced how arbitrary it was that I happened to find myself playing classical music on the cello as a teenager growing up in Kansas, uh, I realized that playing any other kind of music was just as arbitrary. And uh, I really got inspired by the idea of, of, of learning from different traditions. And, um, and, but before we kind of talk hopefully more about that, um, I would love to play some Bach for you because that is kind of my style of origin and where, where I grew up um, with the cello. So I'm gonna play, actually, I'm gonna play the prelude of the third Bach cello suite. Um, and what I like about the Bach cello suites is uh, most of the movements are called dance movements and they're based on actually 
originally, you know, the, the steps of social Baroque dances. Um, but the preludes um, are kind of um, a written down improvisation. And, um, and so they kind of serve as kind of like the thing I just performed, where I kind of played a free improvisation setting up the song, or like in traditional Indian music, the, it's called the alap, and that's what uh, another GMW faculty, Kalarama, was talking about just yesterday. Um, so this prelude kind of serves as the alap to the third cello suite, and I enjoy kind of finding the freedom and improvisational character uh, within it. to the other mic and uh, hopefully check out some questions you have. So feel free to type them now. All right, hello everybody. 
Can you hear me on this mic now? Let's just double check. Yep, looks good. Okay. How's everybody doing here? Let's see if uh, there's any questions already. I see a lot of friends, a lot of GMW friends. Ni hao, woman. Kifak kinan. Hello, Irina. And uh, who else? Virginia, Casey, Hankus, Jonathan, Jasmine. Uh, wow. So many fun friends to see. Um, hopefully there's somebody who... Uh, doesn't know me and might actually have a question. Uh, Mary Tanzer, you've got the first question I see. Do you play the box suites the same way every time or do you improvise a bit, mix it up? Um, I've gotten a little obsessed with figuring out how I can improvise within the box cello suites in like the past year. I recorded uh, the complete suites and released an album um, th uh, just this January. Um, of the complete Bach cello suites. And after recording them all, um, I basically just never wanted to practice them again. Um, editing solo Bach is possibly the least enjoyable professional activity I've ever endeavored on. Um, but the some of the things I've done, uh, other than just like wanting to feel free, maybe playing different slurs, different ornaments, um, is... Uh, I, I've done a few kind of analysis things um, with, you know, some of the movements where uh, like the first step is to take the chord progressions and try and hear the harmonies and, and even improvise within the harmonies of the piece because uh, Bach thinks harmonically. And so the story he's telling is a harmonic story. Uh, and so identifying how he's using the harmonies um, and then seeing if you can improvise within that story, I find really um, satisfying. And then another thing, obviously, you know, Bach's melodies are also great too. Um, so I did like what I call like a skeletal guide tone analysis, uh, where I took sort of like the main notes of the melody. There's so many notes in Bach, not all of them are important. So taking the guide tones of the melody and, and, you know, making sure I hit those. So I get the shape of the melody whilst at the same time treating everything else as negotiable. Um, and so uh, I can maybe try and demonstrate that. I actually tried this um, in my folk trio uh, with mandolin and bass. I gave them the chord chart to the current of the first suite, and I gave myself that skeletal melodic guide tone I just mentioned. So the current usually goes like this. So if I reduce that to like the guide tones of the melody, it might actually just be like this. <laughs> that kind of feels maybe like you know the spirit of that opening phrase so if you try and hold on to that and improvise around it sort of just an example of how I can um, ruin what Bach wrote, um, which is kind of a favorite practice pastime of mine. Um, but yeah, Bach is definitely kind of a such a cornerstone for anybody with a, a Western classical training. You kind of have to kind of engage with it at some point. Uh, let's see, I've got a question from Adam, question from Virginia. Adam's asking, how did you first get started playing non-classical styles of music? Yeah, so as a cellist, the training is pretty narrow. Uh, and I, you know, what I, when I think of classical training, it's usually defined by the teacher deciding what piece you play next. Uh, and so there's kind of this systemic lack of empowerment for the student to follow their own interests. And so I really didn't have any experience outside of what my teacher was telling me I should work on next. 
um, until like late high school. Some friends of mine had a rock band and they let me play with them on one song because they were doing something based on the chord progression of Pachelbel Canon. So I would kind of mess around with, with them for that. But it was really in college um, that I started joining, actually graduate school, really. Um, when I moved to New York, I was on Craigslist a lot and finding rock bands to join. And that was incredibly sa satisfying to essentially go from, you know, orchestra rehearsal at Juilliard and then take the Crosstown bus with my cello and my amplifier and then go rehearse with a, with a rock band on the east side. Uh, so I was kind of starting to live a double life already when I was in school. Um, and then the real, the two game changers for me uh, was meeting uh, the Silk Road Ensemble. Uh, in summer 2005, they did a workshop. No, actually, 2004. 2004 was the workshop I participated in. They did a workshop at Tanglewood, and I was a student. And, uh, and it was just a life-changing experience to engage with all these different traditions. Um, and then a year later, in 2005, um, they asked me to go on tour with them for the first time. Uh, it was a Japanese tour, uh, the first time I got to play with them as a, as a, you know, a member. And then uh, around that same time, right as I was graduating school, I got hired by Mark O'Connor to play in his Appalachia Waltz Trio, which was another life-changing event um, to engage with like American folk styles. And then Mark brought me to his fiddle camps and where I met so many amazing musicians and encountered even more traditions, um, largely American based. And so, you know, between, you know, the, the acoustic string world, which is such a thriving community and, you know, the connections and communities I've met through Silk Road and Global Musician Workshop, it's it's kind of those two paths, you know, that took me through kind of like American communities and styles um, as well as stuff. Um, from across the world. Uh, Virginia's asking if I can talk a bit about my approach to American folk and bluegrass tunes. How do you translate them into your contemporary voice, into the cello? That's a great question, Virginia. Um, what's great about bluegrass and in related styles is that they're string-based. So as a cellist, I found I was welcomed, you know, with open arms to most situations where a fiddle was already, you know, appropriate. And so um, let me think. Actually, so, you know, a big part of crossing styles is about understanding what your assumptions are. Um, and so if you want to play bluegrass, you cannot. You cannot use the sound that you've been told as a classical cellist for 20 years that is, quote unquote, good, right? So, you know, a good cello sound is like. sonata you want to have a lot of depth and a lot of classical music and you know as a cellist that translates to a lot of arm weight you know the Dvorak concerto is just arm 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 arm, 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 arm and you're just oh, you're just you know powering through as loud as you can um, half the time that sound quality does not serve you well in bluegrass um, and so you know learning to redefine what a good sound is is the first step uh, to, for any cross stylistic work, um, and then there's other things like vibrato and you know quality of groove that help you try and speak more natively. But there's also connections between the styles. Virginia, I want to actually make one connection um, to what I was just talking about with Bach, and the reason it occurred to me to reduce Bach down to melodic guide tones and improvise around them is because that's actually a big part of bluegrass improvisation. And so if I took, if I took a bluegrass tune, uh, Whiskey Before Breakfast, it sounds like this. So now the thing about that tune is you can change half the notes 
and somebody could still recognize it as whiskey before breakfast. <laughs> And so there's this like indefinable quality for these folk tunes where different musicians play them totally different. There's no one version of Whiskey Before Breakfast. Um, yet at the same time, you can recognize it when you hear it. And that is just a fascinating component to the fluid nature of, um, you know, a lot of music that is transmitted orally instead of written down. And so uh, that idea of taking the guide tones of Whiskey Before Breakfast. You know, those are the skeletal notes that around which everything is actually negotiable. So as you're playing bluegrass, um, it, you know, the approach ends up being a very, so I'm going to try and avoid getting blocked by my own name here. Um, you know, the approach is similar to what I was describing with Bach. Okay, I've kind of um, had to come to terms. You know, I love I love exploring the different mindsets of different styles, but that just makes me feel like a constant imposter, where I'm doing everything mediocrely. That was okay. Um, let's see if there's any other questions. Um, Casey is asking about some favorite warm-ups and exercises. Um, I want to answer your question, Casey, but I don't want to go down the cellistic nerd rabbit hole that I will never, um, I will never come up out of, uh, if I start to answer your question meaningfully. So let me see if there's other questions that, um, I can get to, and then maybe I'll come back to you if, if there's a lull. Um, Charles is asking, what's your advice to young players looking to broaden their style? Any thoughts of how and where to start? Um, yeah. You know, I don't know what young player you're thinking of. Um, maybe you're thinking of someone with a traditional classical uh, background. Um, but I often, you know, sometimes classical musicians think that in order to improvise, they have to play jazz. Or in order to be creative, they have to compose a symphony. Or, you know, there's, you know, various, you know, expectations that, oh, I should be doing something. Uh, but really, my best advice is whatever you like to listen to for fun, that's what you should try and learn. So if you don't listen to jazz, don't, you know, spend 10 years studying jazz if you don't like it. Um, you know, you, the whole point of music is, is being able to participate in things that you love. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you know, my first advice to everybody when somebody asks me how to branch out is I tell them whatever your favorite song is and, or whatever your favorite band is, learn one of those. Learn one of those songs. Learn something you already love and feel that empowerment um, as you're playing your instrument. And then, yeah, um, as I saw Miriam say, I, I do run a, another summer workshop that actually is happening online in a couple of weeks. We obviously got canceled due to COVID, much like Global Musician Workshop. Uh, but the Mike Block String Camp uh, is happening July 6th through 11th, and it's uh, an array of teachers from different styles, but all for string players. Um, so you could check out MikeBlockStringCamp.com. Um, hi, Lewis. Hi, Jonathan. Sad oboe. OK. Hey, Suzanne. Great to see you. We miss everybody at DePa and at Greencastle. 
Uh, let's see if there's any other questions. Ernie, basis plays all styles. Suggestions on introducing concepts and rep from styles other than Western classical. Um, yeah, so you know, like I said, you know, sometimes when we want a student to branch out, we give them something outside of their comfort zone, which is great, you know. Um, but again, if it's not rooted in what the student is excited and inspired by, it becomes just another assignment. So telling a student to, you know, study two five one chord changes in a jazz tomb in order to be creative. Um, if they're not a jazz fan, it might not be super exciting for them. Um, so again, finding ways to help empower a student to play the music they like to listen to, I think is the best starting point. Um, and then once they get a taste of that, then I th then it's more meaningful, I think, as a teacher to share things that you think they should know about um, and be exposed to, um, which is a big part of what happens at Global Musician Workshop. You know, it's like everybody's kind of thrown into these bands um, and kind of diving in with a, you know, uh, a, a Balaguete who plays Malian Balafone. And his, um, his, uh, his community meeting is on Monday. Or Wuman, who plays the Chinese pipa. When you just get thrown in a room with them for hours and you're asked to play their music, you know, that exposure becomes a part of you. Um, but even that, even those assignments we make at, GMW are based on the student's interests and the idea is that learning is better when the student wants to learn the the material um, so I you know finding what inspires a student is is half of the battle yeah uh, let's see Fritz Goodnow asking my favorite question how is it you're able to stand and play so fluidly well, Fritz, you may not be aware of this little guy here. Uh, this is actually a cello strap that, um, that I designed and make for purchase for cellists. So if, uh, if you or someone you love is a cellist who needs to stand and feel free, uh, this strap allows them to do that. You know, as I was playing more and more non-classical music, I found myself more and more being the only person on stage sitting and I got kind of tired of looking up at everybody and feeling jealous and unable to move um, and so this strap really changes the way that I feel, changes the way that I feel when I perform and uh, I definitely feel more engaged and more expressive um, with it um, yeah so that was a big a big shift for me as a cellist to feel that physicality let's see um, Luis is asking, asking for Ariana, how long did you practice each day when you were young? Ariana, are you the same Ariana who is 10, who is my student through Artist Works? Hi, good to see you. Um, when I was 10, I was probably practicing like 20 to 30 minutes a day. And then, you know, as you get older, you know, it increased to 45 minutes a day and then an hour a day you know, probably by middle school and then maybe, you know, high school, hour, hour and a half. Um, I do remember explicitly um, lying to my parents about how much I practiced back in those days. And I really wish I had practiced as much as I said I did. Um, that would have been very helpful. Um, but it was really kind of towards the end of high school when I realized I was preparing for college auditions and I got a new teacher and I started practicing like four hours a day, um, like junior, senior year of high school. And then in, in college, I was caught up in the somewhat unhealthy community of, of competitive practice links at uh, Cleveland Institute of Music, you know, where it's like freshman year, everybody's at the end of the day, be like, how long did you practice? Only five hours, I practice six hours. And so there's kind of like this focus uh, of, you know, basically kind of, uh, you know, figuring out how, how much you could dedicate to yourself uh, of practicing. But it was somewhat un unsustainable um, to practice that much. Yeah. But I still enjoy practicing as much as I can. Uh, Maurizio 
is asking who my favorite GMW teacher is after Hankus. Uh, that's impossible to answer Maurizio uh, publicly, but I'll text you the answer um, uh, privately. Let's see. Jonathan asked, do you find yourself wanting different gear to play in different styles? Um, do you find yourself making sacrifices for flexibility? Yeah, that's a great question, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan's a great multi-instrumentalist oboist who's come to GMW. Uh, and I am not really a multi-instrumentalist. I've tried to do as much as I can with the cello. And so the question is, you know, when shifting style, instead of shifting instrument, how can I shift my technical approach? Um, and <coughs> I mean, I don't want to get too boring and uh, technical, but like as, as I was saying earlier, like a classical sound benefits from a lot of arm weight. But you know, groove bass playing, I enjoy the freedom of hinging from the elbow mower. And that ends up being a lighter sound. Uh, and so, you know, and then also with vibrato, the kind of default vibrato for classical music. <laughs> Um, doesn't doesn't work in other styles too. So kind of establishing different habits and defaults is more of how I've approached different styles versus you know the physicality of the instrument. When I did pick this cello out, for what it's worth, I did find myself not liking the old cellos, which are usually considered nicer, um, but they can they come with more personality, and that personality is very good for a lot of classical music but um the, the rhythmic flexibility that i was looking for i found in a newer instrument that i felt like could could be a little more flexible uh, for the kinds of music that i play um let's see it's so great to see all of you and it's so great to see you talking to each other um it feels like a real community meeting um let's see we probably don't have actually all the time left in the world. Um, so I'm wondering uh, if anybody has other questions um, while we're here together at the moment. I'm looking to see if I missed any questions. I know Casey had a question about warm-ups. I, uh, I can definitely kill some time with an answer about warm-ups. Um, one of my favorite things to do um, is still one of the simplest things to do, uh, and it's just long tones uh, and warming up by uh, just playing an open string and trying to feel the even arm weight Know, smooth bow changes, you know, just kind of like a meditative starting point uh, with the cello. I, my favorite ways to start a practice session are either just with long tones where I'm focusing on my breathing um, or to just improvise freely, uh, which has a different kind of meditative quality uh, when you're just playing um, whatever comes to your mind. Um, I do, yeah, I see some questions about albums. I, I've been recording obsessively for, for a few years. Um, and I have two albums still to come out that were recorded and mastered before the pandemic uh, that will be coming out this fall uh, on the label Bright Shiny Things. Um, I've got an album called Guzo, uh, which means journey in the Americ uh, language of Ethiopia. And uh, that album features all original compositions, um, but each composition is is developed and recorded collaboratively with musicians from different styles and cultures. So there's a, actually Bala Quiete, who I mentioned, uh, he's giving his community meeting on Monday. Um, uh, he and his band and I uh, recorded one of the tracks on this album, and then a couple of Persian um, participants from GMW, Farzin and Asan, they helped me write a Persian tune and recorded it with me, and there's a, a Chinese tune, Danny McConan, who taught saxophone um, helped me write the the Ethiopian style tune uh, 
And uh, so, yeah, it was really a collaborative um, album where I was trying, I mean, this is kind of a nice w way to kind of frame a lot of, of what I do professionally, which is that um, I was trying to find, you know, what kind of musical voice I might have in other styles and kind of this idea that, you know, you are a different person. You act differently around your spouse or partner than you act around a student or a teacher or a friend even. And so this idea that different parts of you come out with different people, I was kind of transferring that to a lot of my musical friendships and like what kind of composer am I in a Persian musical context? And can some of my Persian friends help me write something that feels native to their musical language? And so using that process of, uh, um, you know, trying to write something native in somebody else's language, um, you know, to see what, what is my musical voice that develops in that environment um, uh, was a big part of the process for that album. It was very satisfying. And uh, a handful of those tunes from the album I have taught at GMW uh, in past years, like Iniche Kosa Bay and Expression of Concern which is a very odd title uh, for a tune inspired by Arabic music. And um, yeah, there's two other GMW participants, uh, Amel Vaker and Cheren Termenkoglo. I, I really apologize, Cheren, for, for not saying your name correctly. But they, the, the two of them and another percussionist did a Khaliji Arabic song um, on the album with me. And yeah, so you guys should look out for that. I'm really excited to share it. Uh, let's see if there's any other final meaningful questions. Yeah, so Bailey, maybe, you know, Bailey is asking about the process for composing new music or arrangements. Um, much like the way that I prefer to teach, I try and do as much by ear as possible. Uh, and so what that means is there's a lot of recording involved. Uh, and so I'm kind of recording a lot, listening back to a lot, and using improvisation as a primary tool for composition. You know, when you're staring at a sheet of paper, it's hard to feel inspired. Oh yeah, Kinan Ednawi was also on uh, that album. Uh, hi, Kinan. Kifak uh, Kinan helped me uh, with that tune, Expression of Concern, that I mentioned. Um, and uh, maybe I'll end with that. Um, but yeah, you know, using improvisation as a way to explore ideas is just often faster and more fun than staring at a sheet of paper for me. And so um, I usually treat the notation part as like the final step. Um, and, then, and then I go back and forth, I read my notation and um, you know, try and have the notation and the feel that I want when I'm playing you know, match up as much as possible. Um, and, but that's a big part of my process is, is improvising and recording. And I kind of, sometimes I think of a composition as full of improvised ideas that are worth hearing again. And that's kind of like my barometer. Like when I'm improvising and trying to come up with something, you know, improvising can be a rambling meditative experience um, where you don't necessarily need to rehear anything because you're just kind of talking stream of consciousness. But when you capture a phrase or a statement that lands and has extra power it, if it seems like it's something that needs to be heard again, that's usually when um, I, you know, I want to commit to including it in the composition. Um, uh, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, another question. You guys are full of questions now, right at the end. Mimi, good to see you, Mimi, asking about a preference of composed music or improvisation when playing with global musicians. Um, it depends. I like, um, I like having like a, a melody to start with some starting point, uh, to react off of. Um, cause you know, when two musicians are coming from totally different style, well, actually a free improvisation can be really fun too. Um, I would definitely say I would prefer improvising versus playing notated music, um, when collaborating across genre. Um, and that's an, another big part of what I like about 
cross-cultural collaboration is like, you know, if I am playing in a string quartet, I know the role of the cello in a quartet and how how to be a good quartet cellist is like a thing that you can define and you can, in a way, you can kind of like grade somebody, like how good of a quartet cellist is he? And that's a different kind of role than like an orchestral cellist or a solo cellist. And so those roles, you know, in the standard rep are so codified that one thing I really love about playing with musicians from other genres is the expectation of the role I'm supposed to fill is often eliminated. And so I can kind of, I feel like I can be more personal and, and more authentic in a cross-cultural experience, uh, often because, um, you know, the role is not predefined. Um, and the most satisfying collaborations are not, you know, when one, for me, are not when both people are fulfilling pre-existing roles, but it's really a conversation between two people and that any other two people, you know, w wouldn't produce anything close to, to um, you know, what is actually able to happen in that unique conversation. Uh, so that's a big part of why I love, you know, doing this work of cross-cultural collaboration is I feel uh, more alive and more kind of engaged with my inner musical voice often, um, or at the very least having to confront my inner musical voice because the other part of cross-cultural collaboration is compromise and appreciating that somebody else is hearing something vastly different than the way I hear it and that their interpretation of, you know, what something is is just as valid. And so it's another way to kind of confront my own assumptions and like helps me. It's like this double-edged sword where it's like it helps you find out more about yourself while at the same time getting out of yourself and out of your own head at the same time. You're learning about the world and you're learning about other people. And so there's a lot of layers um, that I really enjoy experiencing in this cross-cultural work. Um, I see... Uh, Kinan Adnawi, uh, who I miss greatly, um, saying hi. So I'm going to maybe end by playing that Arabic tune that I recorded with Kinan on that upcoming album, Guzo. Um, it's a funny tune, actually. It, I wrote it on the violin, and so it's kind of somewhat simple, actually, uh, but it was just inspired by the energy and, uh, and a scale. <clears throat> that um, I, I found in a lot of Arabic music. Uh, so I'll just play it for you as a, as a way to kind of cap off this session. Here, I'll stand in the middle. <laughs> Thanks everybody for tuning in. It's really great to see so many friendly names. I can't see your faces. Um, but I hope you're all able to tune in to the community meetings next week. It's every day at noon Eastern time in the United States again. Um, and there's just so many great people that have a lot to share. We're all sad that we're not actually in the room together for the community meeting. But this uh, of all the elements at camp, you know, which is very based on ensemble playing, the, uh, these meetings seem like the thing that could transfer online the best. So um, thanks again for helping ask questions, and um, hope you're all staying well. And looking forward to seeing you on the comment box next week for Bala's community meeting and beyond. Alrighty, take care, everybody. Bye.